plan for you. A plan for you. Mr. Jerry Casal, thank you so much for joining us here uh, on the new afternoon show. Well, thank you. And uh, once again, my name is Micah. I don't know if I formally introduced myself. No, you didn't, but now you have. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of the group, Devo. And uh, I'm very excited to see you guys play at the Best Buy Theater here in New York City on June 19th. Yeah. June 19th. 19th. And this is for the Hardcore Devo Tour. Yeah. So do you mind just saying a little bit about what, what the tour is, why it's special? Yeah, well, it's, it's special in so many ways. Uh, first of all, we're doing this to, to honor my brother, who uh, partially was responsible for hatching this idea while he was still alive, and nothing was ever done about it. And we picked it up after his death uh, and said, let's do it and let's raise money versus his family, who's in dire straits. So on that level, it's really special. And it's the only time we're going to do this. It's the only time we've played almost 90% of these songs we're going to play since we played them in 1974 to 1977. And what we're doing is going right back to our roots, like what what was proto-Devo, like... Devo before we had a deal. Devo before the corporation embraced us when we were hardcore and politically incorrect and whacked out. Firstly, let me say I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, and you, uh, and so part of the funds from the tour are going to your brother's family, but you also have a... Uh, a memorial fund set up, correct? Yeah, I did. And that seems to have, you know, that there, there was a lot of interest in that, you know, close to his passing, but then it seems to have uh, just hit a dead spot. So we figured this tour could help out in a more active way. And so if uh, listeners are interested in learning more about the fund... They can go to clubdevo.com. Clubdevo.com, all right. And it's also on the Pearl Jam site and... Uh, on Shepherd Ferry's site, the artist Shepherd Ferry. All right, great. So, Hardcore Devo, that's the name of the tour. It's also the name of a record that was reissued recently and put out, I guess, originally, when was that? Well, Reiko Disc put it out long, long, long ago for a, a brief little period where it popped its head up above the radar and disappeared quickly. <laughs> uh and then I can't remember when that was, like 89 or something like that. Um, and they did two different, they did a volume one and a volume two. And what we did now is we went back and remastered stuff and put it on a two disc set you buy together. So you get two discs inside a jewel box. And that, and it was reissued on Superior Viaduct? Yes, they do a great job. They're, they're a very good company. They are a great. They're a great record label. I'm actually holding my vinyl copies of Volume One and Volume Two, and they're beautiful to look at, and they sound even even better than they look. Let me say. Yeah, they did a great job. I'm really happy. So, how did it come about that reissue? Um, whose idea was it? Did they contact you? Yes. And in terms of the original compilation of the music, whose idea was it to to bring to kind of take these these songs out of the vaults, so to speak? What, you mean way back when, the first time around? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Don Rose came to me and said he heard we had these four-track basement recordings. And uh, I said, yeah, uh, we do. And I go, but, you know, a lot of them are just in terrible shape and, and tapes disintegrating. Let me let me see what we can do. And uh, Bob Sally, my brother and I, uh, went through, you know, <laughs> a couple hundred little seven-inch reels of, you know, four-track tape and, 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 and found about 40 songs that kind of still were in good enough shape to be listenable on some level and gave evidence to the uh, 
the proto Devo period, <laughs> and uh, Don really liked them. So, well, it, it sounds to me that in in three years of recording a hun- hundreds of songs, you you clearly got a lot done, and uh, I think that maybe that says something about sort of the recording process. Is that is that right? We, you know, it was Akron, Ohio. We had nothing else to do. Every night <laughs> we'd get together, and this was the most entertaining thing we could think of doing. And um, we didn't pay attention to the hour. We would just go for hours and hours and late into the night and do it day after day. Well, I can't get no satisfaction. Yeah, I can't get me no satisfaction. Oh, no, 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 I can't get no satisfaction. Oh, no, 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 I can't get me no satisfaction. And, and sort of what was the process like? Would you be with friends? Were you like, we're meeting at this hour to record for this long? Or is it just... This was your. This is the thing you did, and you just got together. Right. You know, Bob Mothersbaugh and I would wait for Mark to show up, and uh, in the beginning, his brother Jim on drums, and later Alan, and uh, we'd set a proximate time, and uh, all be together, <laughs> night after night, and then halfway through 1974, we talked my brother into coming and joining. And the sound started to gel with Alan drumming and my brother playing uh, guitar parts. Do you have any specific memories from from 1974 that kind of kind of sum up uh, what was going through your mind at that time? Well, I, I think um, even though it sounds apocryphal, the overriding story would be when we we had to move out of a house we were in, and where we moved, we didn't really have a, a way to play live music without uh, getting the cops on us. So we rented a garage, but the garage didn't have any heat. And so we were we were all wearing gloves with the tips of the fingers cut out so we could play the guitar <laughs> <laughs> so our fingers could touch the strings properly. And we would be playing in this garage, and I remember Mark singing and watching the, the vapor, like come, you know, like when you're outside in the cold, the vapor come out of his mouth. You and your brother, Bob, were big fans of blues and R&B pretty early on, right? That's right. That's kind of the music we grew up loving. And uh, any any uh, specific favorites come to mind that you remember bonding over? God, so many. It's just so many. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, working in a coal mine, that's kind of why we did that song. Tom, Tommy Dorsey, um, early Motown hits, uh, well, certainly all the blues like John Lee Hooker, Slim Harpo, uh, Muddy Waters. Uh, that that yeah. Lee Dorsey cover, I think, is spectacular. I love it. It might be um, one of my favorite ones off off the uh, the album to listen to. Well, I've been working in a coal mine, going down, down. Working in a coal mine, whoop, a slip down. Working in a coal mine, going down, down. Working in a coal mine, whoop, a slip down. So I'm looking here at this provocative cover art. Yeah. Do you mind describing, uh, well, there's, there are lots of pictures to talk about, but I'm looking at the ones where on Hardcore Devo Volume 1, where you, you seem to be tied up and wearing, like, surgical masks, and you have some mm-hmm. some beautiful woman who's not wearing very much, <laughs> looks to be spitting what? on you. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, that was our Hollywood... Hollywoodization of Devo. We came uh, out to, to Hollywood in um, June of 1977 uh, at the behest of uh, uh, Kip Cohen, who was an A&R man at uh, A&M Records, and he had signed the Tubes, and he paid us $2,000 to drive out from Akron and showcase in a club called the Star Starwood, which was the competition to the whiskey. And within days of getting here, some punky girl said, I know a photographer, and 
he wants to shoot you guys. He wants to take pictures of you guys. And his name is Moshe Braca. And we went, Moshe Braca, okay. When? You know, and okay, Sunday afternoon or whatever. And, you know, immediately we, we had our... <laughs> Our bag of tricks, we had our shorts and our our plastic um, breasts, <laughs> uh, the, the novelty breasts, <laughs> and uh, we had our 3D glasses, and we had uh, surgical masks and scrubs, and we had used all these things before, but no one had ever taken pictures of us. Uh, and so we were in his studio for hours and hours and hours, and these girls show up, you know, Moshe goes, they want to be in the pictures. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, <laughs> and it it didn't take long to it go exactly where you would think it would go in an obvious direction. One, two, three, step! But when you look at it now, um, Devo are kind of um, transitioning, you know. We're, it looks like maybe we've had some hormone treatments and we're partly female. <laughs> so it was, it was really a tribute <laughs> to ambiguous sexuality early on. Was this, was this something that people said to you in spite uh, as sort of having a bit of a provocative image and live act? Well, when we got to Hollywood, most people assumed we were gay. Like, in, in this culture out here, they just, they looked at us with our, you know, we were nice and skinny then, and with these carefully done short haircuts, uh, you know, to completely erase any any vestiges of hippiedom. And uh, and the kind of way we moved and the music we made, they, that's that's what they assumed. And... Uh, and then when they found out we weren't, we, they were mostly disappointed. Some of these demos actually made their way into the hands um, and stereos of some pretty famous people, right? And that's kind of how your big career started with um, with Brian Eno, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, Bob Mothersbaugh and I went to a, with our girlfriends, went to a concert with Iggy Pop doing his idiot tour, and David Bowie was playing keyboards. He would just sit there and play keyboards. He didn't do anything but that. And Blondie opened for uh, um, that tour, uh, Iggy on that tour. And my girlfriend knew two of the people in Blondie. And so Bob Mothersbaugh and I were armed with cassettes and printed literature, you know, <laughs> promoting ourselves. <laughs> I thought, let's try to get it to these guys. And, you know, had no idea that what usually happens is bands just complain about people like us and then as soon as you leave the room as soon as they get rid of you with a few you know insincere niceties they toss the stuff in a waste basket and have a laugh but that actually didn't happen the cassettes made their way into a basket and um, Iggy was charged with uh, going through them and seeing a quote if there was anything good in there and <laughs> And, you know, since since this tape had come through, this girl Susan, who knew two of the guys in Blindy, he kind of, like, targeted that tape, and then he played it for David. So while they were still on that tour, he was playing Devo for David Bowie. What, what songs were they listening to? Do you, do you remember? Well, certainly Jocko Homo was on there and Mongoloid was on there. And I think Social Fools was on there. And um, I think uh, Mechanical Man was on there. I'm, I'm trying to remember if there was a fifth song. I think there were like five songs. <laughs> were they those same recordings that, that we have on, on the Hardcore Devo? Yeah. Yeah. 
mechanical man. That's a risky one. <laughs> with all, <laughs> yeah, with all due respect. <laughs> I know. There are plenty of risky ones on there. But <laughs> I'm a mechanical man. I'm a mechanical man. Two mechanical arms. Two mechanical legs. I'm a two plus two equals one in. <laughs> When you when you started hanging out with uh, with Brian, you know, what did he did he say anything about these recordings in particular? No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Brian Eno heard them. What happened is we over the course of time, you know how many things are happening at once. So over the course of time, what happens is we, you know, go out to California and do what I said we did, and we get snubbed by Kip Cohen, and then I refuse to take no for an answer, and I talk everybody into staying, because we still had two weeks left in this apartment he put us in, and I meet Tony Basil, and she helps me get bookings at the Whiskey and a couple other places, and, and it snowballed. We ended up being in California until October and the lawyers and agents and record execs start coming out of the woodwork and and now there's more of them and now there's more of them each show and now they're competing with each other and we we get approached by Stan Diamond David Bowie's lawyer and he's got a company Bule Brothers that has uh, a production deal with Warner Brothers Records and um, that of course appeals to us the name David Bowie since uh, that was a big goal of ours, and he was a big hero. And so we start pursuing that, and that leads to meetings in New York City with David, and he says he wants to produce us, but then he keeps backing off, backing off, backing off, because he's got this project, that project, a movie, you know, <laughs> and so on. And time is wasting away, and, and I'm really feeling like we're we're missing our entry into the marketplace. And when the talking heads come out in December of 77, then I'm really So David says, well, you know what, I'm going to send Brian Eno to see you, and uh, you should talk to him. And so Brian came and saw us live at Max's Kansas City, and, uh, and then we spent a couple days with Brian talking about it, and the deal was done. And all we had to do is fly ourselves to Germany, and he would foot the bill for the recording because he felt confident that he would get it back. We recorded where he and David had recorded in Connie Plunk's studio outside of Cologne, Germany. And we took 30 days total to record Are We Not Men with Brian Eno. Yeah, yeah. We thought, this is it. Our efforts have paid off, you know. And then we get there, and of course, it's like just out in the middle of nowhere in a farmhouse. It's cold as hell. We're put up in a nearby town called Neunkirchen in a bed breakfast hotel with no central heating. <laughs> so the whole experience was frightening. It's almost like we were, you know, in a boot camp or on a retreat. But the one good thing was there were no distractions. <laughs> There was no one around, nothing to do. You know, we, we didn't see anything unless Brian or Connie drove us into town to get something to eat or take us to a spa that they'd like to go to where a bunch of old naked people are walking around <laughs> going from the sauna into an ice pool. I mean, I think the reaction for most Devo fans who heard your first album, Are We Not Men, heard, you know, Brian Eno's beautiful production, 
and then they hear the music you were making no more than a few years earlier that there's just there's right. such a tremendous difference and I, I'm curious from your end <laughs> what that was like hearing your music put through this like godly filter of sorts yeah it became very tingly <laughs> it became almost like a part of the ethernet or something uh, that, that album still has such a bizarre unique sound it doesn't even date because nothing ever sounded like that you don't hear it and go oh that's 1978 because nothing else in 1978 sounded like that and did you feel any kind of like um, identity crisis. I mean, this, these songs, these new, uh, these new recordings, they didn't sound anything like your earlier stuff. I mean, did that seem to bother you? Did you feel like that kind of went against what you stood for? No, I do think I was concerned that they were too processed and that the bottom end was gone and that the the primal grit was gone. I did, I did have concerns about that. But they were still our songs. They were our arrangements, our lyrics, our notes. <laughs> They had just been given the treatment. Fair enough, fair enough. So this is WNYU, so we're NYU's radio station. And you you and Mark have actually been here before. I don't know if you recall. Yeah, I remember that. Because I actually have, um, we digitized all of our interview reels from way back when. And so we have a, a digitized version of your interview here on June 7th, 1988. Wow, I would love to hear that. I will uh, hear that. I will, uh, I, we have it. It's, you know, 32 minutes long. I can uh, send it to you via Google Drive. Great. Fantastic. Bear, my very special guests in the studio tonight are Jerry and Mark from Devo, the band that put the new in New Wave so many years ago. How's it going, fellas? It's going great. Now that's Jerry over there. And Mark, you want to give a quick shout so people will get... It's going good or it isn't. <laughs> Depending on how you look at it, of course. And you guys, you guys are you're promoting some... Uh, it's a, kar- a karaoke event. Right. It's a... Right, it was uh, done at the World. Correct. And, and we sh- we and we shot it and used it as part of the video for Disco Dancer. So you have a new LP out and a new 12-inch called Disco Dancer, which is also featured on the album Total Devo. That must feel good after quite some time absent from the music world. It feels good to have a voice again. Yes, no I, doubt about it. I would... But you know, it's a sad song. It's a dis- he's a disco dancer. But he has nowhere to go. True. Was that a slag or was that a... Uh... No, we're trying to find a place for him to go. Okay. So you're trying to find this man He's a home. He's right now on a trek from the West Coast to the East Coast. He's walking. He, um, it's a benefit. He's raising money for genetic engineering. He's coming <laughs> to New York. We expect him on Thursday. We think he's going to show up at the World on Thursday night around 11 or so. And that's where you guys will be? We're waiting for him. Okay, so you'll be there Thursday night, and we're talking about the World Club, which is, I believe, 254 East 2nd Street or something like that. The address should be, yep, 254 yeah, about East 2nd Street. Yeah, 50 feet in the corner of uh, Houston and 2nd. Yeah, uh, yeah second. exactly. And Avenue C. It's Avenue C. Right around there. So will you be there Wednesday night as well? I know you're having a special tryout party. That's right. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. We'll be there Wednesday hmm. night, too. So you guys are taking up we're residency there, pretty much. We're you got holding the auditions for four hours. Uh, from 6 to 10 p.m. for the uh, karaoke contest where we've done a uh, cover of the Elvis Presley song, Don't Be Cruel, Mm -hmm. that Holland Dozier wrote uh, 31 years ago. That's awesome. So, so, uh, yeah, I'll definitely have to. Do you remember remember anything about that interview or anything about that event? We were smarter then. (laughs) (laughs) It's part of the evolution. We were far more articulate and and clear-headed. Well, and actually here, I'm, I'm looking at this, there's on this little CD, on this little packaging that we have, there's a comment uh, from, the, from the interview where one of you, I can't remember which of you said it, uh, you say, we think the pelvis and the brain should pump together, the spine connects the weenie and brain. <laughs> That's all there is. Well, that could have been either of us. Uh, <laughs> it came from the canon of Devo Beliefs. Yeah. The only thing Devo has ever been interested in is combining levels. We don't like things that exist on one level. We think that's not accurate. That doesn't represent how the brain works. Mm-hmm. We really like combining several levels at once simultaneously and um, and making sure there's a subtext and something else going on to interest people. So we think the brain and the pelvis ought to pump together. Mm-hmm. As opposed to each an individual unit working separately. 
Yeah, because that's not the way things work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the spine connects the weenie and the brain, you know. <laughs> Is there a video for Disco Dancer yet? No, it will exist as of uh, so the June 9th. After the karaoke party. After the, When we film at the World, then we will combine that footage with Los Angeles and show in the video by documenting the two parties in L.A. and in New York City the contrast between the behavior on the coasts. Mm -hmm. And that will be the video for MTV and other right. TVs. So we're not going to actually follow the uh, trials and tribulations of some slicked back, hairy chested, gold chain wearing cliche. Uh, I guess I there's the probably some uh, flakes of uh, marching powder on that, on that interview, too. <laughs> All right. Well, um, anything, anything, anything else you wanna you wanna say before we before we end the interview? Um, well, I would like to thank you for even asking me these questions, and uh, and I really think uh, if people come and watch us play these hardcore songs, their their minds are going to be blown. They're not going to believe it. <laughs> <laughs> 